Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Hello. Uh, please, as you join, please introduce yourself in the chat, uh, your name, uh, where you are in the world or in the States. And if you don't work in government, maybe the last time you interacted with someone in government, and if you do work in government, perhaps the last time you spoke with a member of the public. Um, and there's no judgment at all. Not every job requires that you interact with the government. Every answer is the right answer. So please go ahead. Um, I can start. Awesome, we're getting some great answers today. Nice to meet you all. Actually, I'm gonna pause because I think we should uh, get started with the introductions. So welcome everyone to this demo day. I'm just gonna do some quick introductions before we go ahead and get started. If you're just joining us, please introduce yourself in the chat, uh, where you are, um, if you work in the government, uh, maybe you can indicate the last time you spoke to a member of the public. Uh, and if you don't work for the government, please, you can indicate the last time you interacted with someone who did, who does work in the government. Uh, and again, no answer is wrong answer. Every answer is the right answer. Um, so what is TPG? For those of you who don't know and aren't familiar with us, we are a professional association for technologists who serve the public good. Uh, and we support uh, the people who, working, who are working in the public interest technology. Uh, and most of our members do work in government uh, at various levels, but we also have members who work in various other sectors. Um, and we are a community of more than 900 smart, talented, and dedicated people like yourselves. And we regularly introduce new members and welcome new members. So if you would like to join, if you're not already a member tonight or another day coming up, um, please reach out to myself or to Preeti Garg. Uh, Preeti, if you can just wave, uh, let people know. Uh, she and I are co-hosting tonight, so uh, feel free to ping one of us if you are interested in becoming a member and we will get that started for you. Um, so what are demo days? Uh, this is our third demo day. It's a recurring series uh, that showcases and shares groundbreaking work and lessons learned. Uh, and we created this event particularly to share work that isn't normally shared. Um, that includes public interest like our speaker tonight who work in government to improve various processes and outcomes people who work with or in vulnerable and underserved communities, staff who are at all levels, whose work is generally not highlighted at all. Uh, and of course, members like yourself uh, of various di disciplines, backgrounds and levels of experience. And so tonight we are excited to welcome Jara Medar. She is a leader of many hats. She, leads the, she currently leads the crowdsourcing citizen science and prize competition open innovation portfolio at the General Services Administration or GSA, which includes challenge.gov and citizenscience.gov. Previously, she led the innovation sourcing program at the Department of Veterans Affairs Center for Innovation, which includes prize competitions, agency announcements and pay for success social impact financing. Uh, Jara has a PhD in cancer biology and is an Air Force veteran. And on a personal note, I'm very interested in public engagement. And how I met Jara was I asked a question through citizenscience.gov. I figured my email would go into some random inbox, uh, but Jara answered herself, uh, which led to a conversation, which led to this event, uh, which speaks to the kind of leader that Jara is and to the questions that we'll be talking about tonight and the various ways that the federal government does and can engage with the public. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Jara to kick us off. Uh, thank you so much. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for inviting me to meet your community and to um, share knowledge and insights. And I'm really energized. You know, I've spent, I'm in DC right now. I spent the past uh, from my illustrious hotel room with weird lighting. Um, I've spent the past couple of days at this event called the EdX Games that's sponsored by Department of Education, where they bring together um, gamers, uh, game developers, uh, students from elementary school all the way through high school, uh, 
to demo new games and technologies and just to have conversations and uh, share insights. And so I have spent two wonderful days meeting the public and that always just, you know, refills my tank. And so I'm, I'm on the heels of that. So I'm, in, I'm energized. I'm pumped. Let's talk about open innovation. <laughs> um, uh, one thing I want to say before I start, you know, sharing slides and go through uh, more sort of a prepared talk is I want to share a little bit about why I do this. Um, you know, from kind of the the bio that that Shira uh, shared and went through, I have kind of this winding path, seemingly winding path career. Um, and so, what's that about? Um, it's really about this this path to kind of understand what motivates science. Um, what leads to collaborations, how we can develop breakthroughs. Um, I I was a scientist for a long time. Like I'm not one of those scientists that was at the bench and said, I hate this and I'm not doing it and I'm going to go do something else. No, no, I love science. I I dream about science. It's It's in me. I love it. But I always felt like when I was doing experiments that somewhere in the world right then at that moment, someone else was doing that experiment. And I didn't know them. They didn't know me. And what a what? How great would it be if we knew each other? And so I came to the federal government via this um, AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellowship a decade ago, and I landed at this like wonderful oasis in the government called the Global Development Lab at USAID. And they, with them, I worked on prize competitions, and it really gave me this amazing introduction into problem definition working with stakeholders, working with people who live closest to problems to understand the kind of results statement in the solution space, and then to design um, and develop innovation with innovators to meet that. And that's kind of the essence of the beauty of prize competitions and open innovation and crowdsourcing. And I've been lucky enough to keep doing that in the federal government. And now in my role, I lead these communities of practice uh, in total, about 1,300 federal employees across citizen science, crowdsourcing, and prize competitions. And a lot of what we focus on in our community are best practices in public engagement and designing with the public. The division that I work in at the General Services Administration is called the Technology Transformation Services Division. And what that focuses on, or the mission of that division, is to... Um, design and develop a digital government for and with the American people. And, and we do that. You know, our sibling programs are programs like vote.gov, the U.S. web design system, uh, data.gov, digital.gov, and on and on. And, um, and, the work, and so the work that we lead out of general services um, administration in crowdsourcing and citizen science is really to put forward the infrastructure that allows the federal government to engage with the public in scientific discovery, innovation, and solutioning. Uh, we also are subject matter experts in how you deploy and use these mechanisms and this kind of methodology for, for innovation. And so I always say that I have the best job in the federal government uh, for what I'm interested in. I also serve on the White House's Subcommittee for Open Science. And so I'm I'm really lucky like to be at this intersection of all these great things right now. And but today what I'm going to talk about is is challenge.gov. But if any of y'all ever want to connect with me to talk about any of the other things, many things I just mentioned, please do. As Shira said, I am really easy to find. Not only do I have a very unique name that makes me totally unhideable in the world but I will respond to you and I will talk to you. So please, if you want to connect with me, <laughs> I'd love to meet you all, every one of you. Okay, so now I'm gonna um, share my screen and then I'm gonna share the slides. Just one second. Okay. I think this is it. Can y'all see 
I'm working in PowerPoint and I never work in PowerPoint, so I'm not really sure what I'm doing. Can y'all see my screen? Yep, looks great. All right, thanks. All right. Is is there anyone in attendance today that might be visually impaired? No? Okay. All right. Um, okay, so the work that I lead at GSA is mandated by legislation. So during the Obama administration, um, there was the reauthorization of the America Competes Act. And with this, um, with this new legislation or reauthorization of, of existing legislation, it gave the head of every federal agency the authority to run prize competitions. Um, but prize competitions in the federal government are not new. And, you know, if the design for the U.S. Capitol building prize competition, the White House design prize competition, transatlantic flight prize competition, do you like navigating at sea? prize competition. Do you enjoy spam and canned meat? You can thank Napoleon Bonaparte and prize, a prize competition. Federal governments, um, go governments around the world have been using prize competitions for centuries to innovate in new ways with new people and to solve important problems. Um, but with the passage of the or reauthorization of the Competes Act, this really allowed for the broad use of prize competitions across government. And prize competitions or prize authority is a separate authority than grants or contracts. With grants, you use assistance. With contracts, you use procurement authority. If you wanna run a prize competition, you use prize authority. And I'll talk about some of those specific benefits um, of prize authority here in a minute. The Competes Act was amended in 2017 with the Crowdsourcing and Citizen Science Act. This gave every federal science agency the authority to use crowdsourcing and citizen science as new forms of engaging the, the, the public in scientific discovery and resource uh, research. It gave us really the legislative authority to embark on new forms of participatory resource, research and community-led um, research and design. Um, both of these um, pieces of legislation and amendments led to the establishment of challenge.gov and also citizenscience.gov. So citizenscience.gov has been around since about 2017 and challenge.gov has been live since 2010. Since 2010, we've hosted on challenge.gov about 2000 competitions. But the federal government in that time frame has run many more prize competitions. Um, if an agency wants to run a prize competition, they don't have, they're not required to host it on challenge.gov. Um, although most agencies do, the requirement under competes is only that the prize competition must be announced and hosted on a federal website that is available to the public. So fully um, accessible to the public. And challenge.gov just happens to meet that requirement. Um, also, I want to mention, you know, in the federal government, we're not a fee-for-service shop. Any agency, anyone with a .gov or a .mil, any of you who might be here right now, you can create an account on challenge.gov and you can basically create all of the content that is required and mandated to run a prize competition that is federally sponsored. If you have authorization to program funds, um, you can use the prize competition um, as long as it meets your you know, necessary expense doctrine and requirements. So anyone in the federal government can use challenge.gov at no cost to run their prize competition. We're seeing more and more agencies run prize competitions on challenge.gov. So far, over 100 agencies, divisions, offices, bureaus, have run prize competitions. And we meet new agencies and offices every, every day in our jobs that are interested in prize competitions. We've seen over $500 million in prize funds that um, have been programmed through prize competitions. Um, that's a very conservative estimate. Um, we also have seen prize competitions that are, are awarding non-monetary prizes that oftentimes have greater value 
than monetary prizes. And I'm happy to give some examples of those if any of y'all are interested and why that why that's important. So to the federal government, there are a lot of benefits to running prize competitions. The primary benefits that we're seeing are partnerships. Under prize authority, the federal government can enter into very flexible forms of partnership with other federal agencies or with the private sector, with nonprofits, with academic institutions. The federal government can really partner with anyone in the pursuit of running a prize competition. The federal government, and this might be surprising, can even solicit partnerships from outside entities for the purpose of running a prize competition. Um, and these partnerships have kind of interesting dynamics. It's not just that we're seeking funding for the prize competition. Oftentimes the partnerships are really powerful because the partners have non-overlapping roles. So the government, for example, might be providing the prize purse, but the Gates Foundation might be providing um, the reviewers and evaluators, or they might be designing the prize competition requirements and structure. Um, if it's federal agencies, it may be that one agency is sponsoring the competition and another agency is providing a testing location for technologies that are being developed as part of the competition. The partnership aspect is, is really powerful. Also, prize competitions attract kind of non-traditional solvers to the federal government and federal agencies are able to bring innovators to problems um, that don't typically work with or partner with the federal government. Um, prize competitions allow out of discipline perspectives to be brought to bear to a problem because most of the time in prize competitions, almost always in prize competitions, we don't ask about like who you are, uh, show us that you have talent on your team to address this problem. Uh, attach resumes or or anything. Um, and for the reviewers, the the names of the submitters are blinded. And so unless the submitter self-discloses who they are or what institution they are at, the reviewers don't know. And so it really does allow for this kind of level and even playing field for running a prize competition. And that allows us to create equity and participation. Um, Prize competitions allow the federal government to pay for success and not to um, program resources towards something with the hope of success. We really are identifying a variety of different approaches to solving a problem and then awarding, after we've seen all of those approaches, then awarding um, the top performers based on the criteria. Benefits to innovators for participating in prize competitions. As I said before, we don't ask who you are. Uh, we don't know who you are, hopefully. And selection isn't based on something you've done in the past. Selection is based on what you're doing right now in the competition. And because of that, what we often see, and I think it's necessary sometimes for transformational innovation, we see that an engineer, for example, that works in a biomedical engineer that works in uh, kidney dialysis, for example, might apply that same technology to water desalination and and you know approach this kind of complex problem in a new way using a technology that traditional water desalinators never would have thought about um, and and it performs with greater efficacy with prize competitions another thing that's really valuable to innovators is that it's no strings attached funding it really is electronic funds transfer into your bank account when you win a prize competition. There's no reporting um, after the fact. It, it really allows you to, um, it kind of functions like innovation investment funding, non-diluted funding for innovation. The intellectual property remains with the innovator. Um, with contracts and grants, the government can exercise um, this thing called the Bayh-Dole Act, where the government has an intellectual property stake um, and anything that was developed with uh, federal dollars. With prize competitions, we typically do not take an intellectual property stake. 
that's really important for technologists because when you're seeking follow-on investment, you don't want this federal toothless encumbrance of on your intellectual property. And so it allows you to keep it. Also, um, many agencies, especially Department of Defense now, Department of Homeland Security and GSA, in our prize competitions, we're inserting this clause that basically says, if the federal government derives value from the submissions that are received or the innovations we source from this competition, we reserve the right to enter into direct activities with the winners. And so what that could mean if you're DARPA, for example, is that the prize competition can serve as like a, a phase one of a sourcing activity and they can invite the winners of the competitions or anyone who submitted a proposal, they can invite them to directly submit a proposal, thereby limiting the competition uh, for follow-on funding. Some people might think, well, that's that's sole source or that's not fair. But you know, typically when the federal government, we wouldn't see an example or performance before we awarded that contract. With the competition, we're really able to get a, a better idea of, of what's viable, what's going to be viable out there and where to make investments. So agencies are using prize competitions really to kind of address a, a diversity of different topics. Some agencies use competitions, um, like if you're NASA, maybe you you wanna use a competition to develop uh, new algorithms for adjusting the ailerons on the International Space Station. <laughs> that was a competition. Um, or if you're USAID, maybe you want to better predict the next location of genocide. That was a competition. Um, there are business case and entrepreneurship prize competitions. A lot of competitions, about half of them, are kind of simple ideation concepting challenges. There are many design competitions um, on challenge.gov. A lot of the design competitions are that are just pure design competitions are focused on architectural design. However, we see a lot of competitions that are using a multi-stage approach where design is one stage of the competition, maybe an early stage, and then the top designs are then invited to prototype in a follow-on stage. We see scientific discovery uh, prize competitions. There's one right now on the platform called the Neuromod or Neuromodulation prize competition. In that competition, they're seeking um, new technologies for pain management. What's interesting about that competition, speaking of non-monetary awards that have value, is that the winners of the second phase of the competition then work hand in hand with the FDA as mentors for development and fast tracking their technologies for approval. We don't see as many IT um, software competitions anymore. Um, I feel like federal government is kind of shifting away from that, but they used to be very popular. Um, technology um, demonstration hardware competitions, that's my expertise. And we see a lot, we've seen a growth um, really a huge expansion of the use of prize competitions to develop technology in the federal government. Department of Energy are leaders in this kind of space. Uh, right now, I'd like to, I have a couple of logos on here. One's for the Intersection Safety Challenge from DOT, and one's the Beams Challenge from NIH. And so I want to kind of give y'all, to further explain kind of what a prize competition is, to describe these two challenges for you in a little bit of detail so you can see, and they're very different competitions in prize purse and also in scope of what we're asking public solvers to do. But now I'm gonna kind of go into a little bit of detail about them. So the intersection safety challenge um, is really the second large scale prize comp multi-phase prize competition that's been hosted by the Department of Transportation. The first one that I co-designed with them was the in Inclusive Design Challenge that they ran um, or wrapped up a couple of years ago. They found great success in that competition. One of the primary um, success findings that they had was that it, it created this really interesting competition between the usual kind of players in transportation design in that space 
and new people coming into the space. And DOT had been, they decided to run the competition because they had been asking um, auto manufacturers for a long time to really focus on, on design of new transportation kind of features and automobiles for those uh, specifically in wheelchairs and or to design um, kind of modification technologies to modify um, uh, vehicles so that they could better be used by those in wheelchairs. And the industry really wasn't doing it. And so they decided to use a prize competition to surface new ideas, new innovations, new technologies, and to put the industry on notice that DOT cares about this and we're going to innovate in this space. And what happened with that challenge was that the large manufacturers who worked in, who should be working in that space came to the challenge and they participated and they participated alongside um, innovators and, and companies that had been trying to break into the space, but couldn't. And also those kind of new teams, university teams even, that decided to work on this problem uh, to demonstrate their skill sets and to have a kind of experiential uh, process for demonstrating their skill sets. So they found a lot of success with the competition. And I think that one was around $2 million or $2.5 million. And so they made an investment and decided to do it again, but on a different topic. With the intersection safety challenge, they're really looking to address this problem with intersection safety, wherein um, uh, so road users, as they call them, so any any individual who may be using a road at an intersection, um, they're looking for new technologies so that you can predict and sense when an accident might happen and then prevent it from happening. Because um, in 2020, they found that 27% of all road fatalities happened at an intersection. And so they wanted to address this problem. And so they developed a, it's really a two-stage competition, but they're only revealing stage 1A and 1B right now. But in, in stage 1A, they're seeking concepts, kind of high-level concepts about how, how would you, what types of sensors would you develop that basically can can utilize a diversity of different data types at an intersection and then put forward some sort of warning to those that are at the intersection that an, an accident might be imminent. Um, they're going to select, I think, the top 10 of those concepts and award them up to $100,000 each, I believe. Yeah, for a total of $1 million dispersed across those teams. Then they're inviting those 10 teams to participate in the second part of that first phase, they're calling it 1B, where they have a, a intersection and it's a closed course, but there is an intersection and they will be testing these technologies head to head at this intersection uh, and measuring performance across a, a variety of different categories. And from that, they'll select up to five winners. They'll each receive a million dollars. And then kind of like I was mentioning before, those five winners may be invited to submit a full proposal for a contract to develop their technology out further um, and or to do kind of more advanced piloting and prototyping. So this is a really good example of uh, what I think is a, a, a sophisticated technology development and head-to-head -head demonstration competition. You know, in what I've found in demonstration competitions and how this model is so effective is how the government typically award would award this is there would be a, a RFP, a request for proposals that would be announced to develop new technologies for intersection safety. And then they would receive proposals that are all just this is my team. We're really good at this. We have a history of doing this. This is how we're going to do it this time to address this problem. And, and it's going to be, I don't know, millions of dollars. And then they will select the best written and most convincing proposal, one, to receive that funding. And then they will go off and do it. But in this prize competition model, they're not prescribing, they're not putting forward specific requirements 
for how this technology needs to be built at all. They're just saying how it must perform and how they're going to measure it. And through this competition framework, they're able to see, to, to get the really nice proposals and concepts and whatnot, but they're opening up the field because we're not looking at past performance. So they will have participants they have never met before. They have never come to Department of Transportation to address this problem, maybe for the first time using new, interesting, exciting technology that may work or it may not, but they're gonna try it. And it's, it's gonna be really interesting. And from this competition, they're gonna pressure test these prototypes head to head. And it won't just be based on how well somebody wrote this. It's going to be based on how it performs. And that is, in my mind, how it should be. And then they're going to fund with a follow-on contract the thing that performed really well as a prototype. And I think that's beautiful. And to me, that exemplifies like the power of this type of approach. But not everything is a $6 million multi-phase complicated technical competition. And that's what I love about my job. The BEAMS challenge from the NIH, this challenge is, is seeking to address this problem where what they're seeing, and, th and this is from the, um, it's the National Biomedical I Imaging Institute. And what they're seeing is that students aren't really being exposed to imaging technologies and data re with, with regard to imaging and biomedical engineering applications in healthcare until they're in college. And so a lot of students who may have been interested in pursuing this have already decided on some other path because they weren't exposed at a young enough age. And so they've decided to address that to, to, to launch this competition that is seeking lesson plans and curriculum for four 40 minute, 45 minute classes to introduce middle school students, grades six through eight, to biomedical engineering. And so this is gonna be educators and teachers who are submitting their lesson plans in this competition. And if they win, they're gonna award five $5,000 prizes to these teachers. And, and then if you win, the winning lesson plans will be made publicly available to any high school teacher or middle school teacher who wants to use them across the world. And so I love this competition. I think this competition has potential for impact. I think the prize amount is right. I think it's got like all the right ingredients for making a wonderful prize competition and it's not complicated. You know, there's another prize competition on the site that I wish I could compete in because I love photography. And it's the National Park Service. They have a competition right now where they're seeking photos that, the, and it's for the uh, Prince George Parks here in, in the DC area. They're seeking photos and the winning photo will be on the park pass for a year. That's cool. You know, if you're a photographer, that's really cool. We tried to get them to also give the winner a park pass <laughs> for the year. So we thought that was obvious. And they said they cannot do that. But, um, but yeah, uh, I just, I think that, you know, with prize competitions, you really, there's kind of a prize competition for everyone <laughs> right now on the side. I think we have 45 prize competitions that are open, that are active for participation and they're awarding over $40 million in prize competitions. And there'll be new competitions that are posted tomorrow. And some of them will fall off. Um, these two competitions I just kind of briefly described are live and are active on challenge.gov right now. One of them closes, I think, on the 25th. But there really is a competition kind of for everyone out there based on something you're interested in, based on something that you may have a skill set or a solution for, or you may not. And it might be a reach for you, but why not try? And and the on the website. There, the barrier to participation, we have made it so low. All you need is an email address. You create an account on challenge.gov as a solver. There's a very simple entry form and you submit your entry. Um, prize competitions really are kind of opening up the door for public participation and innovation. 
we're seeing a huge growth in the use of prize competitions across the federal government. Um, the technology demonstration uh, types of competitions are growing faster than any other type of competition. Prize purses are increasing too because agencies are making greater investments in this mechanism for um, innovation. Over 70% of all prize competitions have a partner. Um, I think that's really important. It's profound. It really demonstrates how prize authority is so different than the other authorities. Um, when primary use cases for competitions, what I hear every single week from some like beat down grants manager at some agency, I'll say, why do you want to run a prize competition? And what they say almost always is, we've been running this grant program for years. We are receiving the same submissions recycled year upon year. We're not meeting leading edge innovators in this space. And we want to try a new mechanism that to reach them. Um, also, agencies are using kind of like the inclusive design challenge that I mentioned. They use innovation, um, especially in technology demonstration competitions, to catalyze or spark interest and excitement, renew a field that has grown stale. And so they'll use a prize competition to create friction in the, in the space and bring new players to it. Um, also, um, like, like with dialysis, for example, uh, and kidney disease, the Kidney X Challenge was launched because they, in their um, landscape and state of innovation analysis, they had predicted that it would be about 12 years before innovations hit the market that would move forward, um, you know, and reduce this burden on patients of dialysis. And so they decided to run a prize competition with a sufficient prize purse to jumpstart that and move the market quicker. And, and it is. Um, the good, as I said before, because of the way we've structured the intake process for prize competitions on our platform, platform, we're reducing bias in innovation sourcing. And because we're not asking about past performance as evaluation criteria, people can, it, it, lo it really does level the playing field and allows anyone to compete. Um, and because of that, we're bringing underrepresented innovators and talent to new fields. Um, also, with prize competitions, you can specifically target eligibility to a specific group for participation. So, for example, recently NIH ran a challenge where only students from HCBUs were eligible to participate in the competition. Um, also, prize competitions, they really do reduce, I say reduce the burden of public participation, but they also reduce the burden on innovation because we're not requiring kind of the administrative aspects of reporting and um, you know all, all the things that nobody reads, right? <laughs> and submitting those to the federal government. We're taking that off of the federal government's plate and off of the innovator's plate. And everyone's happy about that. Um, two concerns, and I hope y'all have ideas you can share with me for this, you know, I spent two days at this edX summit and you can tell for me that I like love what I do. I love prize competitions. I just love them. Nobody knows that the federal government does this and people in the federal government don't know that the federal government does this. And so, you know, the slide I showed earlier where, you know, I, I mentioned 2000 prize competitions have been run since 2010 that's actually not very interesting or exciting. We say it because we need a metric about how many, but there's 2000 contracts issued per day, at least. I don't know what it really is. I should look that up. But you know, we're not scaling the use of prize competitions in the federal government. And we should be because the mechanism, prize competitions aren't, aren't an answer, not in, for every problem that you want to solve. And most of the time when I'm speaking to that, you know, sad grants manager from whatever agency, most of the time I don't recommend a prize competition once we've kind of reviewed the problem that they're trying to address. Prize competitions really should only be prescribed for 
has specific use cases in the sourcing decision tree. But we have enough of those use cases that federal agencies should be using this mechanism more than they are. Um, also, prize competitions, and this may be a reason why we're not scaling it. You know, I'm, I said over and over, no strings attached. Funding directly deposited into your account. Because of that, we're not really tracking longitudinally what happened after the prize competition. And because of that, we have a hard time demonstrating the impact of prize competitions. And so those are my chief concerns. We're not scaling it um, at the rate that I, I would expect that we should be. And we're having difficulty demonstrating impact with prize competitions. And so I would love any ideas as, as this community that you may have or any questions kind of inquiring minds types of questions to tease that those problems apart with me yeah so, oh sorry you weren't done never mind oh well i am done these this slide i'm going to leave you with is is kind of all the ways to connect with with me with my team if you're a federal employee join our listserv um if you're if you're not engage with us linkedin youtube all the places i need to change that to x i guess um yeah, engage with us, um, participate in prize competitions, become part of our kind of brain trust. And with that, I'll turn it over to y'all for questions and conversation. Okay, I'm sorry that I stepped on you a minute ago, Joe. I oh, no. love everything that is happening here. Um, I've been in government tech for a really long time. I've been on the government side. I worked at the Innovation Center at CMS. And the hunger for getting new ideas and the barrier to entry for the people who want to bring those new ideas into procurement, you've just kind of Gordian knotted it and have found a way to do it. Um, sorry, very excited. Please, other people can talk now. No, thanks for that. Thanks for that. Thank you, Jara. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yes, everyone who has questions, I know that there were a number of questions in the chat and I could start um, going through those, but I also encourage everyone to jump in because I'm all, I also, just to echo Laura, super excited. Really, I love what you're doing. And it, I, I'd love to hear how we can track longitudinally. But before we get into that, I just wanted to highlight some of the questions that were asked before. So we had someone ask about um, if you could speak to the examples of non-monetary prizes um, earlier uh, in your presentation. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, you know what we found is that some solver communities or, or kind of subject area communities, the notion of competing with each other um, and there being winners and there being losers is actually uh, a disincentive for participation in prize competitions. Uh, we see that in the arts community uh, primarily and NASA recognized that. And so they ran a competition years ago that I love called Artists Inspiring Astronauts where NASA sought art in any medium that could be displayed in the uh, astronauts crew quarters at Kennedy Space Station before they went on a mission. And, um, and so if you can imagine you're an artist, you get this private gallery showing with astronauts before they go into space with the purpose of inspiring them for space travel. And so that competition was very popular and it was just, it was a win at every level the other examples of non-monetary um, are, you know, like I said, with the, the neuromodulation prize, and they also did this with the first Kidney X prize, where once you had made it to a, a certain round in the, comp in the competition, then you were able to work closely with partners inside of the government to continue to develop your technology and to gain that partnership for taking your technology to the next step, which... Um, could be, you know, government testing, or it could be um, finding partnership for commercialization. 
uh, prize competitions. Some agencies are looking to um, add advanced market commitments as an endpoint for prize competitions where you're developing um, an, an asset that the government needs in a certain volume. Um, this is uh, kind of a, an approach that's being considered by agencies that have a dual use problem like DOD or, um, or NASA, right? If NASA needs to develop astronaut gloves, they may in the lifetime only need to buy 10 pair of those. Um, and so what's the incentive for an, an innovator to get into that line of business? And so, but yeah, I think the non-monetary, the, the best non-monetary prizes are developed when the challenge manager works in close partnership with innovators and ask them, what do you need? What are you seeking? Uh, why haven't, what are the barriers for you in scaling and producing this technology? And then they add that in as the government can as part of the incentive structure. Oftentimes it's not money. Thanks. Um, okay, so the next question, and Jared, also, I don't know if you're able to go past 8 p.m. Eastern, uh, if folks have a couple questions, or we can wrap up at 8 if you need to. Uh, but two more questions that I've seen so far, and feel free to jump in if you're if I miss your question. Um, so the next one was, um, they'd be interested to know your insight on why there are fewer IT software competitions now. Yeah. I've run some IT development competitions. When when I was at VA, I ran a couple. One was to develop an, an app for um, patients who have kidney disease so that they can really understand what food they can eat because it's what they can eat is based on the mineral composition in the food, specifically like the calcium and magnesium concentrations. And it's really tricky. And if they eat things, foods with the wrong salt balances, they can go to the hospital. And so we work to develop this app as part of the competition. And then we also, I ran another app development, IT development competition to create um, a tool for veterans, families, uh, any service member or veteran that's interred in a national cemetery to create a kind of digital visitor and legacy space where people that that describes their service, the medals they were awarded, um, that has GPS location, uh, kind of like find a grave where you can, and, and also the ability to see the grave um, and visit it, memorialize a veteran. We, and so we ran a competition to develop that um, technology. IT development competitions are really hard in the federal government because it's one thing to 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 code and to design and then to code, you know, a, a piece of software. Implementing it in the government is a whole other ball game because of security and and uh, authority to operate and requirements around accessibility and everything that is kind of um, can be unique to the government. Also, in the government, kind of going back to that thing I said about decision tree, with what I always say is, if you know exactly the requirements that you need to develop something, and you know that there are companies out there that can build that for you, you do not need a prize competition. You need to go buy that and manage that contract and do it as quickly as possible and put it into production and test it. IT design for web assets, um, optimization of web ass assets. I think that is primed for prize competitions, but we don't see a lot of agencies doing that, unfortunately. I'm asked all the time, because <laughs> we launched the new version of the challenge.gov platform in 2021. I'm asked all the time when we were doing it, they said, were well, you gonna run a prize competition to build challenge.gov? I was like, no, <laughs> no, no. Because I know what I the requirements are, and I know you know that these companies can build it. So I don't need. There's no innovation to be had in building this website. 
um, there's innovation to be had in using the website for public engagement, but to build it, no. There's so, a yeah. tendency in government sometimes to you find a solution and then you apply that solution to everything, even if it's not for your the particular problem you're trying to solve. I've seen <laughs> so that true. so many times. <laughs> so true. Yeah. So the next question was um, curious about without reporting. How do you have have you how have you seen others running prize competitions measure success and impact? I assume you look at the number of participants and the amount of funding rewarded. And I think that goes back to your question about measuring impact and can we track longitudinally and so on, if there's a way to do that. Yeah, you know, the in impact measures that we use, I call them soft metrics, and they are things like number of submissions. Um, number of attendees at events, which are really engagement metrics. We measure conversion. So how many followed a prize competition and then attended the event and then submitted um, a submission. Um, and all of those aren't, we're not measuring the impact or the efficacy of a prize competition or innovation metrics. We're measuring engagement. Those are engagement measurements. And so the only agencies that are able to measure true impact are those that as part of their kind of terms and conditions of participation, they, they state up front in their competition that we will engage with you to check in, to, to ask how things are going. Um, the kind of two sides of, of kind of thought to that. One is how fair is it to engage for the government to engage a competition participant without paying them for their time after the competition has been concluded, um, which I think is valid. Another, um, you know, is that if we start engaging them post-competition, it starts to feel like the federal government engaging you in something post-competition. -com and so it can feel intrusive. Um, the way that we do measure impact are in sneaky ways. So <laughs> we will, for example, um, if I'm designing a prize competition, like in education, for example, I should announce the competition at the edX games, right? Where there are thousands of participants. And then I should have the finale on the stage presentation of the competition at the next year at the edX games and then invite those winners the next year to the edX games to be on the stage to talk about what happened after the competition. And so that's usually how prize leads kind of get the, what happened after the competition stories. Also, when you're a prize lead, you develop relationships with your participants and your competition. I mean, I have, I'm connected to all of them um, I know where all of them are now. I know what they're doing. We're still in contact. And so most prize leads will know, but it's kind of just locked away in my email account. Um, we hear sometimes, you know, impact measures. The, th the impact measures we would like to collect are things like if it's a technology uh, development competition, I want to know, was your company acquired? That's a success metric if that's what they wanted. Um, did you obtain a patent? Um, are you on the market now? Uh, did you do additional prototyping and testing? Did you gain partners in, in development of your tech? Those are the types of impact measures that we look for for technology demonstration competitions, but they're, they're hard to find. But isn't there also the... Oh, sorry, Laura. Um, just wanted to follow up. There's um, there was a question that someone had which relates to this. So maybe following up with winners to share their stories in other ways as well, um, and share their success. But also, isn't there's also the question of did we solve the problem you were trying to solve? So the question about intersection safety has our innovation solved that problem? And if so, isn't that a success metric? Sure. But usually with innovation, there's such a long tail 
you know, once an innovation hits the market and is, you know, before we can answer that definitively, did we reduce, you know, did we go from 27% of fatalities happening at intersections to 25? You know, that would be a success metric. Um, yeah, things like that. Absolutely. If you're in that space, for sure. Um, one limitation that is kind of, I'm kind of embarrassing in saying it because it's kind of BS, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that in the federal government, we're not allowed to engage with the public unless we have clearance through the Paperwork Reduction Act. And so we have to put forward and get clearance in advance for the types of questions that we are going to ask the public. And oftentimes the, the average for gaining Paperwork Reduction Act clearance permission to ask questions of the public is about nine months. And so that is sometimes a limiting factor, but with enough planning and preparation, you can overcome that. Um, but it, it does tend to be a factor in challenge managers not engaging with their winners to do the thing like you were, I think, alluding to, like, why not write a blog piece? Why not interview them, right? It's because we don't have permission to ask them those questions. Uh, so that Jara, like a, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Laura. Sorry. Uh, one of the things that I hear you saying, and that I'm very excited to hear you saying, and that I'm pretty sure Shira knows as well, is that the just getting to know people, regardless of the rest of the success measures, gives a broader framework and a, and a broader um, network for a government force to be able to look to the kind of vendors that could do work. Absolutely. You're right. Yeah. What what GSA has started doing with their prize competitions is they use a, an authority called commercial solutions offering. And so winners of the competition can now um, gain a CSO that allows any federal agency to work directly with them to develop technology within the scope of what they develop for the competition. And so yeah, making those networks and creating the pathways where other people can now work with these amazing teams is that's a pathway for scale. Um, and hopefully we'll do more of that. I think our last question was someone mentioned they were interested in what resulted in sole source contracts after a challenge. Uh, what's the question specifically about sole source? Uh, Laura, was that your question? Feel free to jump in. It was. Um, there are a lot of advantage, advantages to a traditional government contractor participating in challenges. Um, one of the ones I'm interested in is, have there been examples of people getting sole source contracts for the solution that they presented to a challenge? Yes. Yes, we recently had that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of new. Um, this approach to adding that clause in there. Um, but Department of Homeland Security did it. They they entered into sole source with the winner of the uh, digital wallet. I think it was called challenge. Um, also GSA recently did this with an AI challenge that they held um, related to healthcare. Yeah. 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 And, and the, well, GSA didn't enter into sole source. The Department of Defense entered into sole source with one of the winners of that competition. So yeah, it is happening. Um, yeah, it's happening. This was so great. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone else have any questions that they want to chime in with? I just think this is so fascinating though, Jara, because like, um, it's just, you know, if, if you're, I imagine the approach for innovation is the best ideas come from anywhere. And so if the best ideas come from anywhere, then that tracking becomes more of a challenge and it becomes harder to scale because nothing is the same. Uh, all problems are different. All solutions are different. So how do you, how do you scale it? How do you standardize it? Like, anyway. A lot of food for thought here. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, and we will share the recording um, and get back to you with it. And uh, Jared, we're looking forward to continuing this conversation. 
uh, with uh, the folks here and folks who weren't able to, to attend from our community. Um, and so thank you again very much for your time. Thanks. So, it was great to meet y'all. Excellent. Have a great night, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Jim. Bye. Bye.